Good morning. Welcome to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of St. Paul. It is great to be gathered together with you this Sunday morning as we are continuing our series that we've called Back to School. And so we are, in our gospel message particularly, going through these very cool lessons, very interesting, very strange lessons that Jesus at times teaches. We know that he is our savior, that the reason he's in the scripture is to talk about how he's come into this world to save us from our sins, but he also had a lot of teaching in there, and we're spending some time on that. And so today, we're going to hear from our Savior lessons on the door to heaven and what that's like. A special welcome to any guests that we might have with us today. If you need any directions at all, maybe to the washrooms downstairs or the nursery, please do not hesitate to ask one of the people sitting next to you in the pew, one of our great ushers in the back there. But at this time, I'd like to direct all of our eyes to the prayer upon entering the church. It's at the very bottom of the very first page there. What we'll do is we'll pray this prayer together. But first, let's have a short moment of silence for meditation to get our hearts and minds ready to hear what our Savior has to teach us. Heavenly Father, the door to heaven is narrow because the only way is through faith in Jesus. Give us faith that clings to Jesus and Jesus alone. Give us hearts that love what you command. Amen. And we'll begin in the red hymnals, the red hymnals in the pews there with hymn number 581, Father, we praise you. May God richly bless your worship this morning. I invite you now to turn to page two where we'll join together in singing our musical confession and absolution. Please stand. And we begin then, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's presence, 
maker of the heavens and earth, we created us to love him, to serve him as his precious child. We have disobeyed and erred, thus deserving wrath and anger. Lord, to We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. For your Son has suffered for me. Give himself to God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as Christ's servant, you are his own dear child. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you the strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, preserve the congregation of believers with your never failing mercy. Help us avoid whatever is wicked and harmful and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Please be seated. Our first lesson comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Despite at one time rejecting the narrow door, to Israel comes the promise of spiritual and eternal deliverance through the prophet Isaiah. God says to Israel, and I, because of what they have planned and done, am about to come and gather the people of all nations and languages, and they will come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and I will send some of those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians, famous as archers, to Tubal in Greece, and to the distant islands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory among the nations, and they will bring all your people from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and wagons and on mules and camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. And I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord, and they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die. The fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you now to pick up those red hymnals, open up to Psalm 72, which is found in the front of the hymnal, the small page numbers, page 93. On page 93, you'll find there Psalm 72, and we'll join together in singing all the words of this psalm.
Our second lesson comes from Romans chapter 9. So in our first lesson, we heard how God calls people into his eternal deliverance, but there are those outside of his eternal deliverance. What's the difference between the two, between those saved and not saved? Here, Paul makes it clear that only faith in Christ Jesus and the birthright given by our second birth into the true Israel of God gives access through that narrow door to eternal life. Paul writes, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sonship. Theirs the divine glory. Theirs the covenant, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. This, too, is the word of the Lord. We turn now to our verse of the day. After the verse, we'll join together in our alleluias. Alleluia. Your words became a joy to me and the delight of my heart. Alleluia. respect for the words and works of our Savior, please stand for our gospel. Our gospel comes from Luke chapter 13. The narrow door to eternity is open only to the spiritual children of Abraham, that is, those who have faith in Jesus as their Savior. This will be the basis of Pastor Getzinger's message this morning. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will not answer. I, he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast of the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We'll join together in our hymn of the day, number 337 in those red hymnals, Delay Not, Delay Not.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If it looks like a duck, and it waddles like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, can we agree that that's a duck? This is not a trick question. Can we agree that this is a duck? Sure, okay. So when it comes to Jesus, if he looks like a man, and he speaks like a man, and he eats, and he sleeps, and he gets tired like a man, can we agree that he's a man? Yeah, I think we can. When it comes to Jesus, though, he says things as a man that make him sound like he's either absolutely crazy and off his rocker, or he's God. Things like this, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world. I am the gate, and I'm also the good shepherd. I am the resurrection, but I am also the life attached to that resurrection. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he goes and he does things as a man after saying things like that, which make him sound a little bit and he does things that, at the very minimum, tell us that he is at least from God. Like stopping a storm on the Sea of Galilee in its tracks with merely a word. Like allowing and causing Peter to be able to defy gravity and the density of H2O and walk on water. Like, take 10 men with a death sentence called the disease leprosy and heals them by telling them just to go see the rabbi to get checked out that they are ceremonially clean. By healing numerous and almost countless sick, by giving sight to the blind, by restoring the legs and the limbs of people who were born lame, by, to our knowledge, giving back life to at least three dead people and healing from a distance at least one that we know of, the centurion's favorite servant. And then on top of all of that, it rolls around in John chapter 10 where he says, I and the Father are one. For me, that clinches it. You put this all together, and what you have here in this Jesus is none other than God. And this Christ of God is also humanly one of us. Let that heat your head up for a while, thinking about it this afternoon, but thank God for it. So when this Jesus comes to our town this morning through the scripture of the gospel, and he tries to teach us a lesson about a very narrow door, it would probably be a good idea if we turn up our hearing aids and put away the coloring books and listen very carefully to what Jesus has to say to us this morning. You see, this Jesus, this, this human son of Carpenter Joseph, while the scriptures don't tell us, I think it's pretty self-apparent that being the son of a carpenter, Joseph, he would have known a thing or two about doors. Don't you suppose? Don't you think somewhere in the first 30 years of his life he learned how to go and measure up the opening for a door, and he learned how to construct a door, and he learned how to install that door? So using this very simple object that you and I go through dozens, if not 50 times a day, the Son of God uses this object of a door to teach us a deeply spiritual and very personal lesson using some very straight up language, some straight talk about a narrow door this morning. So back then, Jesus was going through the towns and villages, and he was doing what he does and what he loves to do best, and that is to teach the people about heaven. Today, Jesus comes to our town through the scriptures to do the very same thing. And back then, just as today, a lot of people are just kind of totally off the topic, and they throw out this obtuse question, um, 
are only a few going to be saved, Jesus? It, does that not strike you as just being a little weird, off topic? Jesus is talking to people about how to get to heaven, and this individual, don't know if it's a man, a woman, or a child, a teenager, asks the question, how many are going to get to heaven? What does that have to do with the price of potatoes? Anyway, he asks a question that is a simple yes or no question that Jesus could have just said, yes, only a few are going to get to heaven. No, only a few are going to get to heaven. But Jesus is wiser than that. And he takes this question and he doesn't answer how many. He doesn't answer who. He rather takes it and he refabricates his answer and he refocuses it to cause now the crowd that is with him to ask themselves, how can I be sure that I am going to be saved? And this is the reply that gets them thinking that way. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Hmm. Make every effort kind of sort of makes it sound like Jesus is telling you that you need to strain and strive and fight your way to heaven like you're fighting your way during the fire alarm to that narrow fire door exit on the side of the building, doesn't it? But that would be just totally contrary to everything that the scriptures have already taught us about forgiveness, and then ultimately heaven being a free gift, right? So if Jesus is not promoting a supplemental option B copay plan in order to get into heaven, what exactly then is he saying here when he says make every effort? Make every effort to strain and to strive, and to fight, and to scratch and claw against your natural inclination to make your own door to heaven. Fight and strain against your natural inclination to make yourself the center of your universe. And then that whole inclination is just going to be fueled by sin, Satan, and society. When all those efforts of yours to get yourself to heaven, when all those efforts of yours to get you to beat your chest of how great you are and how the sweat of my brow and the strength of my limbs has won this for me, when all of that comes crashing down, when all of it fails you, Repent and come back to your Savior and admit, I'm sorry, I was a total fool. Forgive me. And be assured that just like the hymn writer wrote, Jesus sinners does receive. As the psalmist said, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. You're forgiven. So Jesus comes to our town this morning through the scriptures. The Holy Spirit's working on us this morning, and he's trying to teach us this lesson that we are one of, what are we up to now? Seven billion people on this planet that are on this journey from here to eternity. The question before us that Jesus is kind of like pushing right in our face is, which eternity? Uh, Is it going to be through the wide door of your own making that leads, he says, to eternal anguish? Or is it going to be through the narrow door that leads to eternal bliss and peace? At the end of your days, are you going to hear, away from me, all you evildoers? And that evildoers is a nice English translation of the literal word, doers of unrighteousness. Why does he call them doers of unrighteousness? Sinners. We're all sinners. Sinners but they have no saint quality to them. They have not been clothed in the robe of righteousness that Christ has won for them and put on them at their baptism. So they're doers of unrighteousness. 
no matter how noble their acts may be in the sight of men. Is that what we're going to hear? Is that what your children and your aunts and your nieces and nephews and uncles are going to hear at the end of their days? Or are they going to hear, welcome to Mount Zion? I may, may, I may not be pounding the pulpit this morning. I may not be jumping up and down with uh, too many coffees and too much caffeine at excitement this morning. But I, the urgency in Jesus' words here this morning is palpable. You can almost taste it and feel the electric energy and urgency coming off these words. It has been said that God's grace is unlimited, and that is true. But my friends, our time of grace is not unlimited. At some point, every man, woman, and child in this room is going to be called home out of this veil of tears. So, reject the one true God. Forget about the one true God. Wander away from the one true God. Push away the one true God. Ignore the one true God. Simply allow other things to take priority over the one true God. And Jesus' warning is urgent and clear and blaring like an alarm bell here this morning. The day is coming when the door is going to be shut. Where are you going to be? And what are you going to be found doing when that happens? And oh, by the way, you apply this to yourself or the people you know any way you want to. A passing acquaintance with Jesus, a passing acquaintance with the name Jesus is not going to cut it. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God but you yourselves thrown out. Like I said, this is the human son of the carpenter Joseph speaking here. This is also Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, the divine son of God speaking here. This is the I am Jesus speaking to us here this morning. Some straight talk about a narrow door. And thank God that he does. This is the one who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, comes to the, no one comes to the Father except through me. That means Jesus is the narrow door. There's no other way. So, if Jesus' message to us is urgent this morning... And if he said people will come from east and west and north and south and they'll take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. And God uses you and me, his children, citizens of his kingdom, to fulfill this prophecy. There's a couple of things that we could ask ourselves. What kind of sense of urgency does this give me as a parent to make sure that my children are being raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? at home, which is where it starts, and being raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord here in the institution of the church that is here and designed by God to assist you as parents, meaning Sunday school and catechism class. Yesterday we had our grade one catechism class and we had about half of the students show up. This is not good, God's people. Bible class. There's going to be CAP class starting up. There's a women's Bible class that meets once a month on Tuesday nights. There's Sunday morning Bible class. We're always here, 9 o'clock. Um, we're always ready to go and share God's word. If this is what Jesus is describing, and we are also called to help fulfill this prophecy, what sense of urgency does this give you? What impact does this have on your own personal outreach efforts? You know people who do not know a, a wit about this narrow door because they're too busy making their own door to heaven or not even worrying about a door. 
Might I just simply say that people who are not members of this church, or we could even encompass it, enlarge it, we could say people who are not members of the one holy Christian church, they're not the enemy. They're victims of the enemy. Just like you once were. I know, I, I know. The Spirit blesses His word where and when it pleases Him. I understand that. But the scriptures also tell us that it pleases Him to bless His word when it is used with every effort. Like Jesus' half brother James said under inspiration of the Spirit, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, if it is not accompanied by same Greek word, every effort is dead. There is an absolutely amazing promise that closes out this gospel lesson before us here this morning. And it's, it, it says, Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. You were once last. And God the Father did not close the door on you. In fact, Jesus died in his love for you. And he relived. And he saved you. So thanks be to Jesus this morning for taking the time out of his busy schedule to come to our town again this morning and speak to us through his powerful Holy Spirit and give us some pretty straight talk about a narrow door that he is having a whole lot of urgency and excitement about here this morning. So that when your day comes, that you are called out of this life, by God's grace, through faith in Jesus, this Jesus is going to take you through that narrow door and he is going to allow you to hear the fruits, hear you, hear the, 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 the unmeritous reward, if you will, of your life in Christ. Welcome to Mount Zion, he's going to say to you, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You will get to see the Lamb on his throne. That is a message to go out and share this week outside these walls. May God bless your efforts in doing that. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, it will guard and it will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I direct you now to your service folder, page 7, and we're going to join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of this ancient creed, the apostles. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated and will now take the collection of our offering.
Let's turn to page 8 to the prayer of the church that's found there. In our prayers today, we're going to be praying for our brother here at St. Paul, Jim Petrie, who's getting a pacemaker put in this Tuesday. Please stand. Let us pray to the Lord on behalf of his church, the nation, the world, and all people according to their needs. For the joyful proclamation of the gospel here and throughout the world, that those who hear may be brought to faith, strengthened in faith, and equipped to live out faithfully their, their baptismal calling. Let us pray to the Lord. For this congregation and for the work of the Lord given to us to do in this place and for our unity of faith and life in Christ and for our faithful financial and prayerful support of all that God has given us to do, let us pray to the Lord. For our care and nurture of the children God has given to us in the homes where our families dwell, in the churches and educational ministries where we support the parents, and extend what begins in the home. And for those who teach our children, let us pray to the Lord. For the leaders of the world entrusted with authority and given positions of leadership, that they may serve well, act with integrity, and heed the voice of God's word in the fulfillment of their duties. Let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and those who suffer, for those troubled in mind, for the grieving in their sorrows and for the dying in their last hours, that the Lord would grant them the comfort of his presence, relief according to his will, and peace in their hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Merciful Lord and Savior, you have promised to be with your believers everywhere and in all circumstances of life. May the assurance of your abiding presence and love, and loving care, comfort, and sustain your servant Jim as he faces and undergoes surgery. Remove all anxiety and fear from his heart and lead him to rest all his confidence in you. Bless the work of the surgeons and give success to the surgery as it pleases you. Be with Jim as he recovers and, fulfill, and fill him with an abiding thankfulness for all your blessings. O Lord, our God, whose mercies are new every morning, we give you thanks and praise for all your kindness towards us. And we pray you to grant us the willing, the will and desire to worship you joyfully, to serve you faithfully, and to proclaim boldly your mighty acts of deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we offer to you these prayers and in whom we trust for all things. To you alone be glory, honor, worship, and praise, O Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll join together in our next hymn, 389, Rock of Ages Cleft for Me.
Please stand for our closing prayer and blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace. And we'll remain standing for hymn number 293, that beautiful hymn, God's Word is Our Great Heritage. You may be seated for just a moment. Good morning again. Welcome to all of you, especially to our visitors. Please take a moment to come and say hello to Pastor Thompson and me on your way out. As we are getting set up for the Wells Connection for the month of September, I just want to remind all of the voters of the congregation that we are having a voters meeting today starting at 1 o'clock. And in our never ceasing struggle to make your life as simple as possible, we will actually feed you at noon as well. So if you need to run your spouse home and you want to come back, we'll have some food for you. We begin at 1. Um, our chairman of the Board of Stewardship also has a brief address that he would like to make to the congregation this morning. I don't have to yell. Um, most of you should have received on your way in a uh, monthly status on our offering, and I just wanted to make a few highlights. First of all, I wanted to thank everyone. I gave an update in June prior to summer, and thank you for your generosity. Your offerings throughout the summer have been able, enabled us to continue with all of our operations and helped us start up with our youth coordinator activities. That's really great. Uh, we are in good financial shape for this time of year. We are ahead of plan in terms of our giving. We have, uh, as I mentioned before, a number of additional expenses this year. Uh, thankfully, the combination of parking revenue and offerings together is meeting that requirement. We have um, a little bit ahead of the game on that. So thanks again for that effort as well. We will be starting a new stewardship program coming up this fall called for 10, 10 for 10. We'll provide you more information shortly on that. That's going to be a great program. And just a final note for those who are not going to be at voters, we will begin our annual budgeting process uh, is starting now, so we'll be putting together estimates for our 2020 budget. Once again, thank you for your generosity. There is information. If you have any questions on the charts, please come and see me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray Johnson. Roll that beautiful gospel footage. <laughs> 